When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that likes our Wednesday shows just a tiny bit more than our Tuesday shows. Here is the captain. Do you know why? Huh? Do you? Because it's hump day. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. As a wise man once said, keep rolling, rolling, rolling. Today we are sipping on some mighty fine Rollerblade, which is a double dry hopped IPA featuring Galaxy Hops, 8% ABV, four and three quarter bottle caps, garage grade. And here's some fine rolling, rolling peeps from our show that helped us out with this week's beer fund. Cheers to Jacqueline and West Concho Hawken, Pennsylvania. And a big shout out to Jess in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Here's one captain for Brooke from Collie, Western Australia, who says, long live the captain. And a big shout out to Brooke from Arkadelphia, Arkansas. Big cheers and thank you to Jillian in Rialto, California. And last but certainly not least, we have Abby in Tuscarora, Ohio. Everyone we just mentioned helped us out with this week's beer fun. So cheers and thank you to you. Thanks for supporting the show. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for going to the website and adding to the tip jar. And if you would like our old episodes, they're all for free on the Stitcher app. And check out our bonus show called Off the Record on Stitcher Premium. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. We couldn't talk about this case, the wrongful conviction of Ryan Ferguson and Charles Erickson, without introducing someone who's a very, very big part of this case and this story, Bill Ferguson, Ryan Ferguson's father, and his efforts to right this wrong and get his son out of prison. And for me, the Bill Ferguson story starts with seeing him in court fully supporting his son. And what's amazing to watch the body language and the facial expressions as the trial goes on and what you can tell he is thinking on the inside. He's, I've hired this defense attorney. This guy is a reputable, supposed to be one of the best in the area. And he's watching this guy fumble through the case, fumble through the trial. And he's thinking, my God, I've paid this man all this money. and this is not going to work out for my son. We also see Ryan Ferguson on the stand, who, as the captain pointed out, 
he seems a little unengaged or, or doesn't seem, doesn't come off to at least express the severity of the situation. And I think we've seen that plenty of times with these individuals who deep down in their heart, they know they're innocent. They're sitting there on trial. And I think that they think at some point the truth will come out. They, there's no way they can convict me of something I couldn't have done. Well, and the other problem is this defense attorney looks like a penis with a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, am I wrong? No. Every time he talked, all I could see was a penis with a mustache. But could you imagine Bill Ferguson, it, you being Bill Ferguson, sitting there at this trial thinking of the, who knows how much he paid that I've, I've reviewed cases where they've paid defense attorneys $150,000 and these guys don't put on a good case. They don't represent their client to their best of their abilities. He's sitting in court going, I just paid this man all this money and he can't even, he can't even poke holes in the prosecution's theory. He can't even show up with a map with the actual buildings on it that he's talking about. You know, we see this all the time and that's the thing. This wasn't even a public defender and not, not to shit on public defenders. I mean, they literally do the most amazing work. They are incredibly underpaid and overworked, but that's the problem. They're underpaid and overworked. So, you know, if you can afford to hire a private lawyer, you always think, oh, this person's going to be better than a public defender who has a million cases and sometimes only goes and sees clients once, twice before the trial. Um, so it it's really, it's, it's really sad. It's really sad that that happens. What was the background of Charles's family, his, his parents? What did they do for a living? His, yeah. So Charles's father worked in, he worked for the public defender's office. Um, he was an investigator. And Marianne currently is a, is a professor or a teacher. Um, I don't know what she was doing back then, but they are both, you know, he does come from a very nice, well-to-do middle-class family. Well, it also seems like Charles was gifted, like he had a above average level of IQ. Still does. He's he Charles is brilliant and he did and that's that's what I highlight a lot. You know, he was amazing athlete. He was incredibly smart. He did get a scholarship to college and then you know as happens with a lot of teens, he just got really into partying. And that all kind of went out the window for a bit and led to where he is now. Well, but when you look at his background and, and his parents, it, it makes zero sense that it wasn't his father that stopped this whole train because like we, like Nick was saying with, uh, with Ryan Ferguson's father, he's a real estate agent, knew nothing about criminal justice and gets all these wheels in motion and basically is the reason his son got freed from prison. Well, and I want to take this moment to do a little public service announcement here, because if you are going into this trial, Let's put yourself in the Ferguson situation. Your son's being charged with something you believe him to be innocent for. You hire a defense attorney, a defense team to represent him at court. Ryan Ferguson received the highest bail, $20 million, the highest bail from what the documentary tells us to be in the United States ever for a single murder charge. If your defense attorney gets you the highest bail ever in the history of the United States, it's time to switch teams mm. right then and there. $20 million. This kid, they were not going to let him out for a single day before his trial. So Ryan spent how, how long in, in prison? Ryan did a, 10 years. Charles has um, a parole hearing coming up in 2023. Yes, he has a parole hearing. Do you think that is one of the reasons? Because Anybody that hears the Ryan Ferguson case, I think it scares people because it's just something that could happen to anybody. If it could happen to this guy and he wasn't even there and he should have a solid alibi driving his buddy home, that solid alibi turns into the nail in your coffin. Yeah. So I think this story, when people hear it, it scares the living shit out of them because it could happen to you. If it happened to this kid, there was, again, the prosecutor sitting there on the stand saying there's zero physical evidence to even put them at the crime scene. So I think that is what scares 
the living shit out of people. It does. It's it's absolutely terrifying. And I think we were talking about it a minute ago when we're talking about they both come from well-off, middle-class, white families, able to hire private defenders, and this still happened to them. And it, And I think that's what scares people. It's like, if they're not safe, who is safe from corrupt law enforcement? Well, I think that's what created the outrage when people see the initial story because you have to go back and forth a little bit to go, okay, well, well, but Charles is saying that they were there. So there's a possibility that this guy is guilty. We've seen that before, but eventually everybody gets to the conclusion that neither one of these guys are guilty. And it seems like there was this huge outrage for Ryan, but there's never been that outrage for Charles. Well, there's a couple of things to that. So Kathleen Zellner comes on in 2009, and that's, of course, what actually leads to Ryan um, having the conviction vacated. She comes on in 2009. And at this point, Charles realizes Ryan didn't have anything to do with this. And he finds out Ryan has hired Kathleen Zellner pre-making a murderer, but she was still a pretty big shot lawyer. She has gotten some people who are wrongfully convicted off. And Charles reaches out to her and says, I have to say something. And so this is what we see in Dream Killer, and, and parts of it are on um, Charles's website, is this deposition she takes from Charles, where he sits her down and says, actually, I lied. Ryan had nothing to do with this. But I did, and I, I did this alone. And she was like, what? So yeah, it was a shock to her because she's done. She knows so it, that neither now. of them did it. Yeah. So she's like, what? Well, okay. Um, still got to get my client out. So we get Ryan out and Charles is still convinced of his guilt at this point. And he said, I was doing what I could to help Ryan. I realized I fucked up. Like he had nothing to do with this, but I still did because at this point, Charles doesn't know that these police reports were false. He doesn't know that this, these alleged reports of people saying they heard Ryan confessing are false. So he still thinks there's evidence against him in the form of Jerry Trump saying that they saw them. He doesn't know Shana Ornt says she never saw them. So he doesn't know any of this. So he's still thinking, well, you know, people are saying I was there. So I guess I was. Yeah, and one of the real big things in this case for Charles was his friend Dallas Ma- Mallory, I believe yeah. is his name, that Eric was always convinced that he saw Dallas at some point in the night because Dallas was dressed up as a, a possible cop or something. But he's 100% convinced that. So he knows that he went to these parties. He went to this bar. He knows that for certain. He has thousands of people backing up that or hundreds of people backing up that part of the story. The rest of the night in Charles's mind is I blacked out. I don't remember anything. But one of the things that he keeps remembering is I saw Dallas in his car at this traffic light. Well, the traffic light just so happens to be close to the crime scene. So that's really. Well, That's the thing. They, that's what was the lie. They told him that Dallas said that he saw him at that intersection. Dallas said he never saw him. Dallas was like, I saw him at the party earlier. That's what Charles is remembering. He knows he saw Dallas, but it was at this Halloween party. But the police are lying to him and saying, "Uh, Dallas saw you near the crime scene. And Charles is like, well, I do remember seeing Dallas. So I guess he saw me by the crime scene. Charles, again, has no idea any of this is not true until long after his statement to Zellner. Around 2013, I believe, he told me he started kind of figuring out all of this was fabricated. And, you know, he has these now fake memories planted in his head from the police and the prosecution. Well, and this is where it gets pretty interesting to me because they're telling him, like you said, Charles knows he saw Dallas that night at the party. They start saying, well, you saw him at this intersection and Dallas was parked at a red traffic light. You talk to him for a little bit and then he drives off, obviously, when the light turns green. So then you have Ryan Ferguson's father that goes down to the crime scene, walks it multiple times 
goes to this intersection and realizes at that time of day, there's no red light. There's just blinking yellow lights. Mm -hmm. So just that part of the story is fake. And then Dallas then comes forward and says, I felt pressured to say anything. I basically told the prosecution, whatever you want me to say, I'll go along with. And at the time of the murder, he did not have a vehicle or a license. More impossibilities of Charles actually seeing him the night of the murder. Yeah. No, exactly. It's, um, and then, so, you know, I talk about Dallas a lot in my podcast, but there's also Megan Arthur and Richard Walker. Similarly, Charles is given police reports from them saying Ryan confessed and they both later recant and he has no idea about this. He has no idea. So he's still thinking, oh, you know, these two people are saying, you know, I did this. Um, but do you think with his parole hearing being so close that that's an, a reason why people are, don't seem as willing to like try to do something or create some kind of a commotion to help get him out? No, I don't. I don't think anyone even really knows about the parole. I think he's been forgotten. I think so much mm -hmm. of the story was intentionally focused on Ryan. He was the more sympathetic person in the story. And then once Ryan gets out, it was kind of, that's that. I mean, so many people I talk to have no idea there was a co-defendant. They have no idea. Ryan Ferguson was the story. And now Ryan Ferguson is this, the overcoming a wrongful conviction, like hero story. Right. And, and that was that. And, he, and he had a show on MTV for a little bit. Yes. That, that's what the whole show was about, which... You'd think the per first person that he would try to help out would be the guy that he knows 100% didn't commit a crime. Yeah, and there's there's a lot there um, that I don't understand. And I've asked Charles, lawyers, family members, you know, what has Ryan done to help you or to help Charles? And it's nothing. Little to nothing, if anything at all, other than his original statement when he came out of prison where he said, Charles Erickson is a lot of things, but he's not guilty of this murder. And then he's kind of moved on with his life. I don't know. I've never been wrongfully convicted by somebody. I don't know. I'm, I, I cannot blame him for having so much anger. Ten years of his life were stolen. Yeah. But Charles is also a victim, and I can't imagine not wanting to help this person who has been completely forgotten. I mean, the least you could do is use your platform to say, hey, don't forget about this guy. Well, it makes the whole case pretty confusing because if they're letting this individual out and then they're saying he did not do this crime, then by definition, that's the reason why they kept going after Ryan Ferguson in the beginning. They said, well, we know that Charles was with you. So if Charles is saying he was at the crime scene and he killed a man, then guess what? You were with him. And so by using their own logic, if Ryan is innocent of this crime, then by using their own logic, so is Charles. Exactly. And so they just filed a petition for actual innocence in June. In June, it was denied. And now they are waiting to file another appeal. He confessed to this and that, that presents a whole other level of issues in trying to get him out. Yeah. They ignored logic when they took his confession. They ignored logic when they prosecuted Ryan Ferguson and here they are conveniently ignoring logic again. Could you tell us who Kathleen Zellner is for, for the, for the few listeners, because most will know, but could you give us a little background on Kathleen Zellner? Yeah, so Kathleen Zellner became famous in Making a Murderer season two. She took Stephen Avery's case, and she is famous for having had a few exonerees she's worked for, and or I don't even know if I want to say a few. I think she's done, taken 13 cases and, and gotten them all out. I'm not like an expert on her background, but I know she has right. incredible backgrounds, and her whole thing is... I will not take your case. She investigates these cases and, you know, she'll only take a case if she thinks somebody is innocent because she's done the legwork. Well, she even goes a little step further because she doesn't even just try to 
get you off on a technicality. She's also trying to solve the case herself. Right. And so that's like what I was getting at earlier. I mean, she has found with her investigators much better suspects than Boyd, Charles and Ryan, obviously, two men who who later in 2005 committed another very bizarre murder of uh, seemingly random murder. And I don't want to, you know, name names right now, but I am going to get into this in an episode very soon on my Patreon talking with the brother of one of these guys, Charles's mom. She knows a lot about these two. And these were two guys that were uncovered by Kathleen's investigation. So we're thinking that these two guys were indeed these, what the eyewitnesses saw. This one guy looks almost identical to the police sketch, to, to Shana Orn's sketch, yes. So these guys, we don't believe we're just walking by the scene. We believe that these guys were the actual murderers. Yes, based on some, um, their own family saying, you know, they, they have made confession statements um, based on the fact that they have been tied to, I don't, I don't want to say convicted. I know one of them is dead right now um, from suicide, but tied to another very strange random murder of a professor in a very similar situation. You know, she actually just sent me all these files this morning, so I haven't like fully dove in, but I, I'm going to dive in and do an episode on it. Well, and when you read about how great of a person Kent was, it didn't seem like he had any enemies. It, it the, the the question to me was always, which I think made Michael Boyd at least a decent suspect because, well, he worked underneath him. So could there be some assignment that he didn't like? Did he just not like working under the person? That would be at least a motive, maybe not a good enough motive for murder. But other than that, what's the motive here? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing too with Boyd. There was allegedly that argument between him and Heitholt. But I mean, the, the murder was so brutal. I mean, he is strangled with his own belt. He is bludgeoned. It seemed either incredibly personal or incredibly random and psychopathic. And I think with these two other suspects, it seems that they are serial murderers and it is incredibly psychopathic. <laughs> This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.
So that is potentially something that the police did get right, that it was a random act of violence. And I think it's a weird thing with these two persons that are seen, two young white males are seen near the murder scene at the time of the murder. We know this by these our witnesses here. We also know our witnesses are saying it was not Ryan Fergus and he was not one of the people that I saw that night. It gets weird, though, because the the statements from the witnesses at times have been that these two individuals who may be suspects were saying something like, this man needs help. Mm -hmm. So you go, okay, well, maybe these are just two people that happened to walk by and see that something horrible went down just minutes ago. They're doing their best as a good citizen to get help for this individual that they don't know. But then the problem is... They must be suspects, I think, because you got even two years later before Ryan is arrested, before Charles is arrested, where these people, if they witness something, they never come forward. This story's in the news. They don't come forward to say, I was the person that was walking that night. I was the person that called out for help. I was the person that saw somebody and said, we need to get somebody here to help this man. To me, st- very briefly skimming the surface of these two guys, seems like it almost could have been like a facetious kind of like, we just committed this murder and <laughs> this guy needs some help. And then they walk mm. away. Not even like an actual cry for help. Like, hey, uh, uh, this guy might need some help over here. And then they walk away is a possibility. This was not a robbery gone bad. This was, I mean, they had the opportunity, whoever did this, judging by the evidence, they had the opportunity to stop at some point. They could have easily, they they took this man, beat him. They could have taken whatever possessions he had that they wanted right then and there. But whomever did this, they took it a step further with the belt. I mean, think about that psychologically, to take the belt off the victim and then use it to kill the individual. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they actually strangled him so hard that it snapped parts of his neck. I know the belt broke itself. The belt right. broke, yep. Yeah, it was it was vicious, violent, and I believe that at some point, regardless of what started the attack, at, at some point there was a clear intention of murder by whomever did this. Now, you mentioned earlier that there were two persons, everybody knows of the witnesses who recant Trump, and then we have uh, Shauna Ornt who says that Ryan Ferguson was not one of the people that I saw. We have Charles Erickson who changes his story multiple times. It starts off with he and Ryan did this together. Then it ends up with he did it by himself that Ryan may have told him to stop at some point or Ryan witnessed some of it. Charles Erickson says he's uncertain how much of this crime Ryan would have actually witnessed. And then at some point, Charles's story becomes... Ryan didn't do this. Ryan didn't witness me doing it either because I didn't do it myself. Right. Right. Who, who were the two people remind me who were the two people that said, Hey, Ryan Ferguson told us about this, said that he was involved or talked about it at a party. They later changed their story. I don't know the details of that. Do we know why they changed their story? Are there, are they saying the same thing that crane convinced us to come forward with this false information how, how does their, their story change? Yes. So one of them, he is in prison at the time and or in jail. I think he's in jail at the time. So he's got a couple charges and basically, and that's the thing with Trump too. That's how they got, how Crane got Trump. Trump was on parole for um, some kind of sex offense. Crane came to him and said, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you a deal and whatever, whatever, if you say what I need you to say. So here's this other guy jailhouse informant who is striking deals and says, uh, Ryan confessed to me while in prison. Later, he says, you know, that didn't happen. I was making a deal with the prosecutor for, you know, a lesser sentence or charges, whatever it is. And then the other one is Megan Arthur, who was at a party. She did not say that she heard Ryan. She says she thought she heard Ryan say something along these lines, which it's very possible Ryan was saying, yo, Charles is being crazy, saying we did this. So she tells this to the police, and they basically twist her entire statement and say, you know, she told us she heard Ryan saying this. And so both her and the jailhouse informant said, 
none of this happened. Jailhouse informant says, I was just striking a deal, but I actually completely lied. Ryan never confessed to me. And Megan Arthur says, they completely took my words out of context. I never said that I heard Ryan confessing. I thought I might have heard something and I wanted to help. With Zellner being involved with Ryan's case, has she been giving this information over to Charles's new lawyer? They had in the past. I don't think there's been much recently with that. Because what's next for Charles? Yeah, so he had an appeal denied recently in July, and now they're working on filing another actual innocence appeal. And basically it's on the grounds they're trying to get an evidentiary hearing. They can present all of this evidence, all of this prosecutorial law enforcement misconduct. If they can present that there is no evidence, if they can get anything further tested, you know, basically they just want to present their side in front of a jur- in front of a judge or judges. They think it's going to move forward is basically what they have to do. And, and they're doing this on the grounds of that Charles had his constitutional rights violated when they knowingly and willfully got a false statement from him. Now, we know that Charles responded to a letter that you sent, but take us through the process of working with Charles and putting together your episode. What does that typically involve with the individuals that, that you are you are now meeting and presenting their stories. I hear from Charles once a week, twice a week. You know, he's doing a lot in prison. He's working with his dog training program. He helps rehabilitate dogs and adopt them out. Those are like his best friends, he said. You know, again, he's in therapy. He's taking medication. He's working on himself. He's going to school. He's running again, which is what he used to do back in high school. That's how him and Ryan actually met. So, you know, when I first started speaking with Charles, there was just so much to talk about because he's doing so much. So it was like, okay, we want to talk about the case. We want to get to all this. But I also just want to like hear about you as a person. We only hear about this crazy guy with dreamlike memories or snapshots is what he calls them. Who is Charles? You know, what do you do? And he is just so smart and has so much to say. I could talk to Charles forever. So Yeah, there was a lot to fit in this one episode, and I think we covered a lot of stuff that wasn't in it. But, you know, with the episode, I just really wanted to make clear that there is this other person in prison, and he's a good person, and he he was also a victim of all of this. Yes, it very quickly became the free Ryan Ferguson story, and then once Ryan got out, everything is just kind of forgotten about, as you said. Charles Erickson still in prison. The murder of Kent Heitholt, unsolved. Mm -hmm. No justice for his family. No justice for Kent Heitholt. Yeah, and I believe his family is even on the the pro Ryan and Charles side. I mean, they think also recognize... I'm pretty sure I did come across a Facebook page that his family runs, that, that they also believe that this has not been solved. This is a wrongful conviction. They want justice for their loved one. He was a father. He had two kids. He had a wife. They want to know who murdered their dad, and it was not Charles and Ryan, and they support them. Right. If you don't get justice for Charles, you will never get justice for Kent. Absolutely, because it's it's a closed case. It's uh, not being investigated any further. Why are they going to further test DNA evidence when we got this guy in prison till Charles is out? They are not getting justice for Kent Heidholt. Well, not only out, but technically the conviction vacated. Right. right. Because it's one thing to let him out. We've actually seen some cases where they let the wrongfully convicted out but never vacate the conviction. Therefore, it's a closed case, technically. There's no reason to for the state to investigate. West Memphis 3. Yep. Yeah. With Boyd on the surface, he looks like a good suspect. He looks like somebody that we would ha- would question his actions and some of his statements. But as you said, they probably have something that tells them that Boyd is not their guy. It could be the janitors, the witnesses saying we saw two younger white males and Boyd doesn't fit that description. But there probably has some kind of physical evidence at the scene. Uh, The captain pointed out that we have seven or more unidentified fingerprints. There's a bloody palm print, bloody footprints. There's hair at the scene. None of this matches Ryan Ferguson. We, We have that 
That might be the only honest words that came out of the prosecutor's mouth at that trial was that we have no physical evidence linking this guy to the crime. You have to wonder if some of that evidence, if it doesn't point to Boyd as well. You know, Zellner was pretty convinced that they did a really shitty job investigating Boyd. And I think he even says they didn't even really investigate him. So I was just thinking like, oh, well, maybe they took some of his uh, hair samples and DNA or whatever and compared it to what was at the crime scene. But according to Zellner, at least, and how she feels the investigation went, I don't actually think that happened. Um, Yeah, I believe he's only interviewed twice and I don't think any sample was taken. I don't think so either. So I don't really know what they had that they did not follow up on him. I don't think they did compare his samples. Well, the most suspicious thing about that is the getting rid of one of his cars and not really understanding what he did with it or the, what he told law enforcement later, they figured out was a lie. Yeah. And like we said, there would be so much blood at the scene that you would think, if Michael Boyd wasn't involved, you'd think that he would have at least saw the two, two individuals that people think are involved. Well, I think that becomes part of the issue that people have with his story because originally he's telling police that he didn't see and, and, and Maggie, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is he's saying he didn't see anybody. And now when we have two people to pin this on Ryan Ferguson and Charles Erickson, then later he's saying, yeah, I saw two younger white males at the at the scene. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. He he was all over the place. It is it is odd. And I, I you know, I, I wonder if he's just all over the place because he knows he's the last person to see him alive and is scared. Um again, he's he's not a white person. He's a person of color. Like he you know, a lot of people that I talk to just instantly become afraid of the police and that could be why we have the multiple changes in the story. Again, I think there are much better suspects than than Boyd. So, um, you know, when I talk, I, I kind of lean towards the it's not Boyd. But I do think it was really shoddy of them to not investigate him further than they did. Take samples, do more than two interviews, you know. What do you think the likelihood that uh, Charles will make parole in 2023? Parole is so hard because with <laughs> parole, they're not looking at actual innocence. Um, Mm -hmm. they're looking at, do you have remorse for the crime that you're convicted of? Charles didn't do this. How is he supposed to show remorse for murdering somebody when he didn't do this? You know, and a lot of these people I talked to, like JJ Velasquez, in in my case, he's up for parole and he says, yeah, I'll go in front of the board, but I'm not going to confess to something I didn't do. Yeah, I could walk out of here tomorrow, but my integrity is worth so much more than being paroled for something right. I didn't do. And I haven't really asked Charles, but my guess is it would be similar. I don't think he has any intention on saying, yes, I feel bad for murdering Kent Heitholt. So you're not getting paroled unless you say that. And, you know, I talked to some folks, my first episode, episode Jermaine Smothers, he's up for parole. And I do think he'll get paroled because while he didn't commit the murder, he feels like a lot of actions in his life contributed to this murder. He was in a gang lifestyle. So he is going to go in front of the parole board and say like, yes, I'm remorseful for this because my actions contributed to it. So that is different because what actions did Charles do that, that contributed to this murder? I mean, nothing. So I I don't think he's going to be paroled. And the two people that you find interesting for this as good possible suspects Remind me how they came onto the radar. So these were um, from Kathleen Zellner's private investigators. And Mm -hmm. again, I haven't fully, you know, I have the statements, the affidavits from her PIs, you know, interviewing people who say like, yes, this person, um, you know, told me this. And I I think the brother even, I'm going to speak with the brother, believes his brother did it. And and I'm not going to name their names here yet until I go through everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I am going to do an episode about this on my Patreon. But um, they, one of the men, at least, was linked to the murder of a, a professor, a very brutal murder where he was found stabbed, stuffed in his trunk, and the car was lit on fire in a parking garage as he left work. And one of these men was, his DNA was linked to the crime scene. So 
to me, that sounds very similar to a random murder of Kent Heitholt. I mean, they're, it's the same, it's Boone County. So the, I'm going to look into this further, but this is something that Zellner uncovered. And, and I do think, you know, one of these guys at least is still alive. And I know that actually Marianne Erickson has been skeptical about uh, saying his name because he's dangerous and he's out there. And this is in 2005. So these are only a couple years apart that this um, professor was murdered and found burned in his the trunk of his car. Four, yeah, four years from, mm-hmm. from Ken's murder. And so that's yeah. the whole point. When you wrongfully incarcerate people, when you knowingly, I, ha- I do not stray away from saying that uh, Kevin Crane knowingly incarcerated the wrong people that you leave the real murderers out there and now another innocent person is dead if these two were the ones that were involved in Kent Heitholt's murder. And this man looks just like the police sketch. And you're saying that the other, the this professor that they believe this individual is responsible for killing, there's no connection between suspect and victim. It just appears to be some kind of random act of violence. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, again, I haven't dove into this super far, but it looks like this was also a cold case. I mean, it happened in 2005. And it looks like, you know, that he's this name is coming up in 2013, linking him to the, the murder. So that's how you get away with things is random murder. And, and I know you guys know, we talked about this in the Moore Murray case. When these things are random, it's it's really hard to to find the killer. There is a website, freecharleserickson.org, and there is a reward fund of $10,000 for information in the case, in the unsolved, we should say, murder case of Kent Heitholt, and that money is coming from the Ferguson family. Yes. So they're working to at least uh, help to find more information that could help Charles Erickson, or at least help the investigation for finding the real killer of Kent Heitholt. Absolutely. Yep. And like you said, Charles has uh, this hearing coming up pretty soon, and then a parole hearing in 2023. I know that you have a group on Facebook. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that so they could follow that for any update in this case? Yes. So it's the Unjust and Unsolved podcast discussion group. Um, Marianne Erickson, Charles's mom, is in there almost every, if not every, unless they don't have an ins- unless they don't have a Facebook, but every advocate you've heard in the episodes, every sibling, as many investigators as I can get are in there to help answer questions and just be part of these discussions to help solve solve these crimes. It's an unsolved murder. Kent Heitholt's killer is out there. Potentially, if like I said, these two guys have killed somebody else. So potentially, again, killing more people, hurting more people. Everybody always ask, where can we find the music for the show? All the music each week is created by me, your captain, and you can find it. It's all for free on Apple Music, Spotify, or go to our website and click on the music page. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for this week? How about a little recommended listening? Make sure that you check out the Unjust, an unsolved podcast featuring our friend who you just heard here today, Maggie. It's part of the True Crime Obsessed Network, and you can find it wherever you listen to your podcast. And come back and see us next week on Monday. We have a new off the record on Tuesday. We have a new case. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't listen.
you can live out your master chef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. 